So what is the fundamental difference between joint embedding architectures and LLMs? So can uh, can uh, Jabba take us to AGI? But whether we should say that you don't like uh, the term AGI, and we'll probably argue. I think every single time I've talked to you, we've argued about the G in AGI. Yes. I, I, get, I get it. I get it. Well, we'll probably continue to argue about it. It's great. Uh, you you like uh, Ami, I, this because you like French, and um, Ami is, is, is uh, I guess, friend in French. Yes. And AMI stands for Advanced Machine Intelligence. Right. Um, but either way, can Japa take us to that? towards that advanced machine intelligence? Well, so it's a, it's a first step. Okay, so first of all, uh, what, what's the difference with generative architectures like LLMs? Um, so LLMs um, or vision systems that are trained by reconstruction generate the inputs, right? They generate the original input that is non-corrupted, non-transformed, right? So you have to predict all the pixels. And there is a huge amount of resources spent in the system to actually predict all those pixels, all the details. Uh, in a JEPA, you're not trying to predict all the pixels. You're only trying to predict an abstract representation of, of the inputs, right? And that's much easier in many ways. So what the JEPA system, when it's being trained, is trying to do is extract as much information as possible from the input, but yet only extract information that is relatively easily predictable, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things in the world that we cannot predict. Like for example, if you have a self-driving car driving down the street or road, uh, there may be uh, trees around the, around the road and it could be a windy day. So the, the leaves on the tree are kind of moving in kind of semi-chaotic random ways that you can't predict and you don't care. You don't want to predict. So what you want is your encoder to basically eliminate all those details. It will tell you there is moving leaves, but it's not going to keep the details of exactly what's going on. Um, and so when you do the prediction in representation space, you're not going to have to predict every single pixel of every leaf. And that, you know, um, not only is a lot simpler, but also it allows the system to essentially learn an abstract representation of, of the world where, you know, what can be modeled and predicted is preserved, and the rest is viewed as noise and eliminated by the encoder. So it kind of lifts the level of abstraction of the representation. Mm -hmm. If you think about this, this is something we do absolutely all the time. Whenever we describe a phenomenon, we describe it at a particular level of abstraction. And we don't always describe every natural phenomenon in terms of quantum field theory, right? That would be impossible, right? So we have multiple levels of, of abstraction to describe what happens in the world, you know, starting from quantum field theory to like atomic theory and molecules, you know, and chemistry materials, and, you know, all the way up to, you know, kind of concrete objects in the real world and things like that. So the, we, we can't just only model everything at the lowest level. And that, that's what the idea of JEPA is really on, is really about learn abstract representation in a self-supervised uh, manner. And you know you can do it hierarchically as well. So that I think is an essential component of an intelligent system. And in language, we can get away without doing this because language is already to some level abstract and already has eliminated a lot of information that is not predictable. And um, so we can get away without doing the joint embedding, without you know, lifting the abstraction level and by directly predicting words. So joint embedding, it's still generative, but it's generative in this abstract representation space. Yeah. And you're saying language, we were lazy with language because we already got the abstract representation for free. And now we have to zoom out, actually think about generally intelligent systems. We have to deal with a full mess of physical reality, of reality. And you can't, you, you do have to do this step of jumping from, uh, the full, rich, detailed reality to a uh, abstract representation of that reality based on which you can then reason and all that kind of stuff. Right, and the thing is, those self-supervised algorithms that, that learn by prediction, even in representation space, uh, they learn more uh, concept if the input data you feed them is more redundant. 
the, the more redundancy there is in the data, the more they're able to capture some internal structure of it. And so there, there is way more redundancy and structure in perceptual uh, inputs, sensory input like, like, like vision, than there is in uh, text, which is not nearly as redundant. This is back to the question you were asking a few minutes ago. Language might represent more information, really, because it's already compressed. You're, you're right about that. But that means it's also less redundant. And so self-supervised learning will not work as well. Is it possible to join the self-supervised training on visual data and self-supervised training on language data. There is a huge amount of knowledge, even though you talk down about those 10 to the 13 tokens. Those 10 to the 13 tokens represent the entirety, a large fraction of what us humans have figured out. Both the shit talk on Reddit and the contents of all the books and the articles and the full spectrum of human, uh, intellectual creation. So is it possible to join those two together? Well, eventually, yes. But I think uh, if we do this too early, we run the risk of being tempted to cheat. And in fact, that's what people are doing at the moment with uh, vision language model. We're basically cheating. We're uh, using uh, language as a crutch to help the deficiencies of our uh, vision systems to kind of learn good representations from uh, images and video. And uh, the problem with this is that we might, you know, improve our uh, vision language system a bit, I mean, our language models by, you know, feeding them images. But we're not going to get to the level of even the intelligence or level of understanding of the world of a cat or a dog, which doesn't have language. You know, they don't have language. And they understand the world much better than any LLM. They can plan really complex actions and sort of imagine the result of a bunch of actions. How do we get machines to learn that before we combine that with language? Obviously, if we combine this with language, this is going to be a, a winner. Sure. Um, but but before that, we have to focus on like how do we get systems to learn how the world works. So this kind of joint embedding predictive architecture for you, that's going to be able to learn something like common sense, something like what a cat uses to predict how to mess with its owner most optimally by knocking over a thing. That's that's the hope. Uh, in fact, the techniques we're using are non-contrastive. Uh, so not only is the architecture non-generative, the learning procedures we're using are non-contrastive. So we have two two sets of techniques. Uh, one set is based on distillation, and there's a number of... Uh, methods that use this principle. Uh, one by DeepMind called BYOL, uh, uh, a couple by, by FAIR, one, one called uh, VicRag, and another one called iJEPA. And VicRag, I, I should say, is not a distillation method, actually, but iJEPA and BYOL certainly are. And there's another one also called Dino or Dino, uh, also produced from uh, at FAIR. And the idea of those things is that you take the full input, let's say an image, uh, you run it through an encoder uh, produces a representation. And then you corrupt that input or transform it, run it through the, essentially what amounts to the same encoder with some minor differences. And then train a, a predictor. Sometimes the predictor is very simple, sometimes doesn't exist, but train a predictor to predict a representation of the first uh, uncorrupted input from the corrupted input. Um, but you only train the, the second branch um, you only train the part of the network that is fed with the corrupted input. The other network you don't you don't train, but since they share the same weight, when you modify the first one, it also modifies the second one. Uh, and with various tricks, you can prevent the system from collapsing. Uh, with the collapse of the type I was explaining before, where the system basically ignores the input. Um, so that works very well. The the technique with the two techniques we develop at FAIR, uh, Dino and uh, and iJEPA work really well for that. So what kind of data are we talking about here? So there's this several scenarios. One, uh, one scenario is you take an image, you corrupt it by uh, changing the cropping, for example, changing the size a little bit, maybe changing the orientation, blurring it, changing the colors, doing all kinds of horrible things to it. But basic horrible things. Basic horrible things that sort of degrade the quality a little bit and change the framing, uh, you know, crop the image. Um, or 
And in some cases, in the case of iJetpack, you don't need to do any of this. You just you just mask some parts of it, right? You just basically remove some regions, like a big block, essentially. And and then you know run through the encoders um, and train the entire system, encoder and predictor, to predict the representation of the good one from the representation of the corrupted one. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the uh, iJetpack. Doesn't need to know that it's an image, for example, because the only thing you need to know is how to do this masking. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas with Dino, you need to know it's an image because you need to do things like, you know, geometry transformation and blurring and things like that that are really image specific. Uh, a more recent version of, of this that we have is called VJPA, so it's basically the same idea as iJPA, except um, it's applied to video. So now you take a whole video and you mask a whole chunk of it. And what we mask is actually kind of a temporal tube. So an old, like a whole, uh, segment of each frame in the video over the entire video. Mm -hmm. And that tube was like statically positioned throughout the frames? Just throughout, literally throughout, throughout straight the, tube? The, the, the tube, yeah. Typically is 16 frames or something and we mask the same region over the entire 16 frames. It's a different one for every video, obviously. And, um, and then again, uh, train that system so as to predict the representation of the full video from the partially masked video. Uh, and that works really well. It's the first system that we have that learns good representations of video so that when you feed those representations to a supervised uh, classifier head, it can it can tell you what action is taking place in the video with you know pretty good accuracy. Um, so that that's it's, it's the first time we get something of that uh, of that quality. So that, that's a good test that a good representation is formed. That means yeah. there's something to this. Yeah. Um, we have also preliminary results that uh, seem to indicate that the representation allows us allow our system to tell whether the video is physically possible or completely impossible because some object disappeared or an object you know suddenly jumped from one location to another or or changed shape or something. So it's able to capture some physical some physics based constraints about the reality represented in the video. Yeah about the appearance and the disappearance of objects? Yeah, that's really new. Okay, but c can this actually get us to this kind of uh, world model that understands enough about the world to be able to drive a car? Uh, possibly, uh, I mean, this is gonna take a while before we get to that point, but, um, um, and there are systems already, you know, robotic systems that are based on this uh, idea. Uh, and the, what you need for this is a slightly modified version of this, where um, imagine that you have uh, a video and a, a complete video, and what you're doing to this video is that you are either translating it in time towards the future, so you only see the beginning of the video, but you don't see the latter part of it that is in the original one, or you just mask the second half of the video, for example. Um, and then you you train a, a JEPA system of the type I described to predict the representation of the full video from the, the shifted one. But you also feed the predictor with an action. For example, you know, the wheel is turned 10 degrees to the left, to the right or something, mm -hmm. right? So if it's a, you know, a dash cam in a car and you know the angle of the wheel, you should be able to predict to some extent what's, go what's, gonna go what's going to happen to what you see. Uh, you're not going to be able to predict all the details of you know objects that appear in the view, obviously. But at a abstract representation level, you can you can probably predict what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So now what you have is a internal model that says, "Here is my idea of the state of the world at time t. Here is an action I'm taking. Here is a prediction of the state of the world at time t plus one, t plus delta t, t plus two seconds, whatever it is." If you have a model of this type, you can use it for planning. So now you can do what LLMs cannot do, which is planning what you're gonna do so as to arrive at a particular uh, outcome or satisfy a particular objective, right? So you can have a number of objectives, um, right? If, you know, I can, I can predict that uh, if I have uh, an object like this, right? And I open my hand, it's gonna fall, right? <laughs> and, uh, and if I push it with a particular force on the table, it's gonna move. If I push the table itself, it's probably not gonna move uh, with the same force. Um, so we have we have this internal model of the world in our in our mind, 
which allows us to plan sequences of actions to arrive at a particular goal. Um, and so, uh, so now, if you have this world model, we can imagine a sequence of actions, predict what the outcome of the sequence of action is going to be, measure to what extent the final state satisfies a particular objective, like, you know, moving the bottle to the left of the table, uh -huh. um, and then plan a sequence of actions that will minimize this objective at runtime. We're not talking about learning, we're talking about inference time, right? So this is planning, really. And in optimal control, this is a very classical thing. It's called uh, model predictive control. You have a model of the system you want to control that you know can predict the sequence of states corresponding to a sequence of commands. And you're planning a sequence of commands so that according to your world model, the, the, the end state of the system will uh, satisfy uh, an objective that you fix. This is the way... Uh, you know, rocket trajectories have been planned since computers have been around, so since the early 60s, essentially. So yes, for model predictive control, but you also often talk about hierarchical planning. Yeah. Can hierarchical planning emerge from this somehow? Well, so no, you, you will have to build a specific architecture to allow for hierarchical planning. So hierarchical planning is absolutely necessary if you want to plan complex actions. Uh, if I want to go from, let's say, from New York to Paris, this is the example I use all the time, <laughs> and I'm sitting uh, in my office at NYU, my objective that I need to minimize is my distance to Paris. At a high level, a very abstract representation of my uh, my location, I will have to decompose this into two sub-goals. First one is uh, go to the airport. Second one is catch a plane to Paris. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my sub-goal is now uh, going to the airport. My objective function is my distance to the airport. How do I go to the airport? Well, I have to go in the street and hail a taxi, mm -hmm. which you can do in New York. Um, okay, now I have another sub goal, go down t on the street. Uh, well, that means uh, going to the elevator, going down the elevator, walk out the street. How do I go to the elevator? I have to uh, stand up from my chair, open the door of my office, go to the elevator, push, push the button. How do I get up from my chair? Like, you know, you can imagine going down, all the way down to basically what amounts to millisecond by millisecond muscle control, mm -hmm. okay? And obviously you're not going to plan your entire trip from New York to Paris in terms of millisecond by millisecond muscle control. Mm -hmm. First, that would be incredibly expensive, but it will also be completely impossible because you don't know all the conditions what's going to happen, uh, you know, how long it's going to take to catch a taxi um, or to go to the airport with traffic, you know. Uh, I mean, you, you would have to know exactly the condition of everything to be able to do this planning. And you don't have the information. So you, you have to do this hierarchical planning so that you can start acting and then sort of replanning as you go. And nobody really knows how to do this in AI. Um, Nobody knows how to train a system to learn the appropriate multiple levels of representation so that hierarchical planning works. Does something like that already emerge? So like, can you use an LLM, state-of-the-art LLM, to get you from New York to Paris by doing exactly the kind of detailed set of questions that you just did, which is, can you give me a, high, a list of 10 steps I need to do? to get from New York to Paris. And then for each of those steps, can you give me a list of 10 steps how I make that step happen? And for each of those steps, can you give me a list of 10 steps to make each one of those until you're moving your mus individual muscles? Uh, maybe not. Whatever you can actually act upon using your mind. Right, so there's a lot of questions that are sort of implied by this, right? So the first thing is, uh, LLMs will be able to answer some of those questions down to some level of abstraction. Mm -hmm under the condition that they've been trained with similar scenarios in their training set. They would be able to answer all of those questions, but some of them may be hallucinated, meaning non-factual. Yeah, true. I mean, they will probably produce some answer, except they're not going to be able to really kind of produce millisecond by millisecond muscle control of how you, how you stand up from your chair, mm -hmm. right? So, but down to some level of abstraction where you can describe things by words, they might be able to give you a plan but only under the condition that they've been trained to produce those kind of plans. Mm -hmm. 
right? They're not going to be able to plan for situations where that, that they never encountered before. They basically are going to have to regurgitate the template that they've been trained on. But where, like, just for the example of New York to Paris, is, is it going to start getting into trouble? Like, at which layer, layer of abstraction do you think? You'll start, because like I can imagine almost every single part of that an LLM will be able to answer somewhat accurately, especially when you're talking about New York and Paris major cities. So, I mean, certainly uh, LLM would be able to solve that problem if you find you need for it. Uh, you know, sure. just, uh, and, and so uh, I can't say that an LLM cannot do this. It can do this if you train it for it. There's no question. Uh, down to a certain level where things can be formulated in terms of words. But like, if you want to go down to like, how do you, you know, climb down the stairs or just stand up from your chair in terms of uh, words, like you, you can't, you can't do it. Uh, you, you, you need, that's one of the reasons you need experience of the physical world, which is much higher bandwidth than what you can express in words, in human language. So everything we've been talking about the, on the join embedding space, is it possible that that's what we need for like, the interaction with physical reality for on the robotics front, and then just the LLMs are the thing that sits on top of it for the bigger reasoning about like yeah. the fact that I need to book a plane ticket and I need to know I know how to go to the websites and so on. Sure, and you know a lot of plans that people know about uh, that are relatively high level are actually learned. They're not people. Most people don't invent the you know plans. Um, uh, they, they, by themselves, they, uh, you know, we have some ability to do this, of course, uh, obviously, but, um, but most plans that people use are plans that they've been trained on, like they've seen other people use those plans, or they've been told how to do things, right? Um, like you can't invent how you, like take a person who's never heard of airplanes and tell them, like, how do you go from New York to Paris? And they're probably not going to be able to kind of you know deconstruct the whole plan uh, unless they've seen examples of that before. Um, so certainly LLMs are going to be able to do this, but but then uh, how you link this from the the low level of 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 actions uh, that needs to be done with things like like JEPA that basically lift the abstraction level of the representation without attempting to reconstruct every detail of the situation. That's why we need JEPAs for. I would love to sort of linger on your skepticism around uh, autoaggressive LLMs. So one way I, I would like to test that skepticism is everything you say makes a lot of sense. But if I apply everything you said today and in general to like, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit less, no, let's say three years ago, I wouldn't be able to predict the uh, success of LLMs. So does it make sense to you that autoregressive LLMs are able to be so damn good? Yes. Can you explain your intuition? Because if I were to take your wisdom and intuition at face value, I would say there's no way autoregressive LLMs, one token at a time, would be able to do the kind of things they're doing. No, there's one thing that uh, autoregressive LLMs, uh, or that LLMs in general, not just the autoregressive one, but including the bird style bidirectional ones, mm -hmm. uh, are exploiting, and it's self-supervised learning. And I've been a very, very strong advocate of self-supervised learning for many years. So those things are a incredibly impressive demonstration that self-supervised learning actually works. Uh, the idea that you know started uh, it didn't start with with uh, with Bert, but it was really kind of a good demonstration with this. So the 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 idea that you know you take a piece of text, you corrupt it, and then you train some gigantic neural net to reconstruct the parts that are missing. Uh, that has been an enormous uh, uh, produced an enormous amount of benefits. Uh, it allowed us, allowed us to create systems that understand understand language, uh, systems that can translate. Um, hundreds of languages in any direction, systems that are multilingual, so they're not, it's a single system that can be trained to understand hundreds of languages and translate in any direction, um, and produce uh, summaries, um, and then answer questions and produce text. And then there's a special case of it where, you know, you, which is the autoregressive uh, trick, where you constrain the system to 
not elaborate a representation of the text from looking at the entire text, but only predicting a word from the words that are come before, right? And you do this by the constraining the architecture of the network. And that's what you can build an autoregressive LLM from. So there was a surprise uh, many years ago with what's called decoder-only uh, LLM. So since, you know, systems of this type that are just trying to produce uh, words from the from the previous one. And and the fact that when you scale them up, they they tend to really kind of understand more about the uh, about language uh, when you train them on lots of data you make them really big that was kind of a surprise and that surprise occurred quite a while back like you know uh, with uh, work from uh, you know google meta open ai etc you know going back to you know the gpt kind of uh, work general pre uh, pre-trained transformers you mean like gpt2 like uh, there's a certain place where you start to realize scaling might actually keep giving us a, an emergent benefit. Yeah, I mean there were there were work from from various places but uh uh if if you want to kind of you know place it in the in the GPT uh, uh timeline that would be around GPT2 yeah. Well I just cuz you said it you you say it's so charismatic and you said so many words but self supervised learning yes. But again, the same intuition you're applying to saying that autoregressive LLMs cannot have a deep understanding of the world, if we just apply that same intuition, does it make sense to you that they're able to form enough of a representation of the world to be damn convincing, essentially passing the original Turing test with flying colors? Well, we're fooled by their fluency, right? We just assume that if a system is fluent in, in manipulating language, then it has all the characteristics of human intelligence. But that impression is false. We, we, we're really fooled by it. Um, well, what do you think Alan Turing would say? It Without understanding anything, just hanging out with it. Alan Turing would decide that a Turing test is a really bad test. <laughs> okay, this is what the AI community has decided many years ago, that yeah. the Turing test was a really bad test of intelligence. What would Hans Moravec say about the, uh, about the large language models? Well, Hans Moravec would say the Moravec paradox still applies. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we can pass. You don't think he would be really impressed? No, of course, everybody would be impressed. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it's not a question of being impressed or not. It's a question of knowing what the limit of those systems can do. Like, they're, it, again, they are impressive. They can do a lot of useful things. There's a whole industry that is being built around them. They're going to make progress. Uh, but there is a lot of things they cannot do, and we have to realize what they cannot do and uh, and then figure out you know, how we get there. And, you know, and, and I'm not seeing this, I'm seeing this from basically, you know, 10 years of, of research uh, on on the idea of self-supervised learning. Actually, that's going back more than 10 years, but the idea of self-supervised learning. So basically capturing the internal structure of a piece of, uh, of, a, of a set of inputs without training the system for any particular task, right? Learning representations. Um, you know, the... The conference I co-founded 14 years ago is called Interna International Conference on Learning Representations. That's the entire issue that deep learning is, de is dealing with, right? And it's been my obsession for you know almost 40 years now. So, um, so learning representation is really the thing. Uh, for the longest time, we could only do this with supervised learning, and then we started working on uh, you know what we used to call unsupervised learning, uh, 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 and sort of revive the idea of unsupervised learning. Uh, in the early 2000s with uh, Yosha Benjo and Jeff Hinton, then discovered that supervised learning actually works pretty well mm -hmm. if you can collect enough data. And so the whole idea of, you know, unsupervised self-supervised learning kind of took a, a backseat for, for a bit. And then I kind of tried to revive it um, uh, in a big way, you know, starting in 2014, basically when we started FAIR. And... Uh, and really pushing for like finding new new methods to do self supervised learning, both for text and for images and for video and audio, and some of that work has been incredibly successful. Uh, I mean, the reason why we have multilingual translation system, mm -hmm. you know, things to do content moderation on on Meta, for example, on Facebook uh, that are multilingual that understand whether a piece of text is hate speech or not or something is due to that progress using self-supervised learning for NLP, combining this with you know transformer architectures and, and blah, blah, blah. But that's the big success of self-supervised learning. We had similar success in speech recognition. 
a system called wave to vec which is also a joint embedding architecture, by the way, trained with contrastive learning. And, and that, that system also can produce um, speech recognition systems that are multilingual with mostly unlabeled data and only need a few minutes of labeled data to actually do speech recognition. That's, that's amazing. Um, we have systems now based on those combination of ideas that can do real-time translation of hundreds of languages into each other. Uh, speech to speech. Speech to speech, even including, which is fascinating, languages that uh, don't have written forms. That's right. They're spoken only. That's right. We don't go through text. It goes directly from, from speech to speech using an internal representation of kind of speech units that are discrete, but it's um, it's called textless and LP. We used to call it this way, but um, yeah. So that, I mean, incredible success there. And then, you know, for 10 years, we tried to apply this idea to learning representations of images by training a system to predict videos, learning intuitive physics by training a system to predict what's going to happen in the video, and tried and tried and failed and failed with generative models, with models that predict pixels. Uh, we could not get them to learn good representations of images. We could not get them to learn good representations of videos. And we tried many times. We published lots of papers on it. You know, they kind of sort of work, but not really great. They started working, we, we abandoned this idea of predicting every pixel and basically just doing the joint embedding and predicting in representation space. That works. Mm -hmm. So th there's ample evidence that we're not gonna be able to learn good representations of the real world using generative model. So I'm telling people, everybody's talking about generative AI. If you're really interested in human level AI, abandon the idea of generative AI. Okay, but you, you you really think it's possible to get far with the joint embedding representation? So like, there's common sense reasoning, and then there's high level reasoning. Like, I, I feel like those are two, the kind of reasoning that LLMs are able to do. Okay, let me not use the word reasoning, but the kind of stuff that LLMs are able to do seems fundamentally different than the common sense reasoning we use to navigate the world. Yeah. It seems like we're gonna need both. You're not, sure. would you be able to get, with a joint embedding, which is a Jepa type of approach, looking at video, would you be able to learn, let's see, well, how to get from New York to Paris, or um, how to uh, understate, understand the st state of politics in the world today. <laughs> <laughs> right, these these are things where various humans generate a lot of language and opinions on in the space of language, but don't visually represent that in any clearly uh, compressible way. Right. Well, there's a lot of situations that you know might be difficult to for a purely language based system to sure. um, to know. Like, mm -hmm. okay, you can probably learn from reading text the entirety of the public publicly available text in the world that. I cannot get from New York to Paris by snapping my fingers. Mm -hmm. That's not going to work, right? Yes. Uh, but there's you know probably sort of more complex uh, scenarios of this type, which an LLM may never have encountered and may not be able to determine whether it's possible or not. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, so that that link, you know, from the the low level to the high level. The the thing is that the high level that language expresses is based on a common experience of the low level, which LLMs currently do not have. You know, we, when we talk right. to each other, we know we have yeah. a common experience of the, of the world. Like, you know, uh, a lot of it is, is similar. Uh, and LLMs don't have that. But see, there, it's present. You and I have a common experience of the world in terms of the physics of how gravity works and stuff like this, and that, common knowledge of the world, I feel like is there in the language. We don't explicitly express it, but if you have a huge amount of text, you're going to get this stuff that's between the lines. You're going to, you're going to in order to um, form a consistent world model, you're going to under, have to understand how gravity works, even if you don't have an explicit explanation of gravity. So even though the, in the case of gravity, there is explicit explanations of gravity and Wikipedia. Right. But uh, you're like the stuff that we think of as common sense reasoning, I feel like to generate language correctly, you're going to have to figure that out. 
Now you could say, as you well, have, agree. there's not enough text. Sorry, okay. So what? <laughs> you don't think so? No, I agree with what you just said, which is that to be able to do high level um, uh, common sense, to have high level common sense, you need to have the low level common sense to build on top of. Yeah. Um, but and, that's and, not there. And that's not there in LLMs. LLMs are purely uh, trained from text. So, so then the other statement you made, um, I would not, dis I would not agree with the fact that implicit in all languages in the world is the underlying reality. There's a lot about underlying reality which is not expressed in language. Is that obvious to you? Yeah, totally. So, like all, all the conversations we had. What? Okay, there's the dark web meaning uh, whatever, the it, private conversations, like DMs and stuff like this, which is much, much larger probably than what's available, what, what LLMs are trained on. You don't need to communicate the stuff that is common. But right? the humor, all of it. No, you do, like when you, you don't need to, but it comes through, like you, like if I accidentally uh, knock this over, you'll probably make fun of me. In in the content of the you making fun of me will be uh, explanation of the fact that cups fall and then you know gravity works in this way and then you, you'll have some very vague information about what kind of things explode when they hit the ground and then maybe you'll make a joke about entropy or something like this and we'll never be able to reconstruct this again like okay you'll make a a little joke like this and there'll be a trillion of other jokes and from the jokes you can piece together the fact that gravity works and mugs can break and all this kind of stuff you don't need to see uh It'll be very inefficient. It's easier for like to not <laughs> knock the thing over. Yeah, but uh, I feel like it would be there if you have enough of that data. I just think that most of the information of this type that we have accumulated when we were, when we were babies is just not present yeah. in uh, in in text any in any description essentially and the sensory data is much is a much richer source for getting that kind of understanding i mean that's the sixteen thousand hours of a, of wake time of a four-year-old and uh 10 to the 15 bytes you know going through vision just vision right there is a similar uh bandwidth you know of touch and uh a little less right. through audio and then text doesn't language doesn't come in until like you know a year uh in, in life. And by the time you are nine years old, you've learned about gravity. You know about inertia, you know about gravity, you know the stability, you know you know about the distinction between animate and inanimate objects. You know by 18 months, you know about like uh, why people want to do things and you help them if they can't, you know? I mean, it, it, there's a lot of things that you learn mostly by observation. Really, uh, not even through interaction. In the first few months of life, babies don't. Don't really have any influence on the world. They can only observe, right? And you accumulate like a gigantic amount of uh, of knowledge just just from that. So that that's what we're missing from uh, current AI systems.